is to explore the shadow side of having children. All, all the difficulties, all the all the uh, stressors, all the p potential disappointments, and uh, all the all the trouble that having children would make in the life of any couple. Uh, I see myself whenever I'm writing about topics that the lay public might be interested in. I see my challenges to be a myth buster because there are lots of myths that exist in the culture about what the nature of various activities are. And the ones that are esteemed by the culture, those activities are portrayed in a very, very rosy light. And yet all of them have a dark side that's never talked about. And I, I don't like culture in general. I think culture uh, scrambles our brains and pr provides us terrible templates of what life is really like as we uh, live our lives. So I think I leaned in towards too much darkness when I was talking about the having of children. And Scott was a wonderful corrective at the end of the, the time together. He said beautiful things about what's available and what kinds of experiences can be had if one embraces parenthood. And uh, he was quite right. And I could have said many of those things myself, but I, I was so focused on making sure people knew about the difficulties and stress they were going to embrace they had children that I just skipped over that. So I, I am going to try and be my own corrective today, and I'm not going to let the topic go yet. I discovered there are many more things I wanted to say about parenthood that I hadn't last time. And I will even start with what I think is a powerful value of deciding to have children. I focused on uh, what a big exercise in selflessness is the whole venture across the whole span of raising children into independent living. We always have to be focused on what the needs of the people we're mentoring and raising. What are their real needs? What are required of us? And we often have to generate responses and kindness towards them, even if we're feeling out of sorts or even if, if we're angry that this is being inflicted on us. So we learn a great deal about altruism and uh, being devoted if we choose to have children. It is quite a curriculum. It is very challenging. And I have to say learning that curriculum is not always pleasant, but it certainly is always important. So one becomes a better human being, I believe, if one successfully manages to raise children. One becomes kinder, more open to the needs of others, uh, wiser about a whole bunch of developmental challenges that have to be mastered in the world. In general, a, more, a better all around and sensible human and kinder human being eventuates from taking on the task and seeing it through with some distinction. There is an additional benefit. None of us has had perfect parents. Many of us have had quite disappointing parents. And some of us have had egregious parents that were very harmful and uh, really wounded us very deeply as they took us along the path from birth towards adulthood. One of the few transformative experiences that's available to us to rework our own wounds and the structures and templates of our own consciousness is to become a parent. If we can keep in mind what were the disappointments inflicted on us by parents? How did they do it? With what behaviors, with what words? And if we can grit our teeth and not pass that on to our children, resist falling into the same temptation of behaving in very similar ways when we're under stress with the parenting challenge. Interestingly enough, I think we're in the process of healing ourselves as well as doing goodness for the children we're raising. That is one of the few transformative experiences that can lead to great and positive personal growth. The raising of children in exemplary ways when one has not been raised in an exemplary fashion. Very curative for the self. So that is where I want to start, uh, mentioning some of the beauties of, of being a, a parent. And I want to go on with some practical things about parenthood 
that I think ought to be known by people who choose to have parent, become parents and are not necessarily well known by the lay public. Uh, I will not give an entire primer, primer on raising children because that would have to extend from birth to about the age 25 to 30 and then on into what is the parent of a grown child like and I, I, I don't want to write a textbook on parenting right now but I just want to touch some highlights of the early period because this is a period of transition for the couple they have to adjust to and and be responsive to the child and at the same time try to rework and hold on to the shreds of their relationship with each other. So some parts of early parenting I'm going to address, the parts that would facilitate a healthy adaptation and the opposite side of that coin, the part of if not done properly, those kinds of responses to the child should make it harder to restore the ruptured, uh, what is the ruptured bond between the husband and wife for the time being upon the arrival of the child. Uh, the first practical tool I would like to urge on anybody who decides to become a parent is to get a copy of a book that's out in paperback by a, a pediatrician who's located in Santa Monica, California. His name is Harvey Karp, and he's on staff at the UCLA at the Medical Center. Uh, he's written a book called The Happiest Baby on the Block, and it is full of tactics for working with very small children right after they're born. It is tactics for understanding and addressing how to soothe them when they're crying or cranky or won't sleep. Uh, the practical advice is wonderful. He starts with the position that all humans are born prematurely. We ought to think of the optimal length of a pregnancy as being four trimesters, not three trimesters, because by the end of that extra trimester, three months into the baby's life, the baby is much more self-contained and much more able to begin self-soothing than it ever was when it was born. Human beings are born in the biggest posture of dependency of any other living organism, including amoebas, CT flies, horses, all, all those critters can get on pretty well within the first minutes or hours of having been born. Human infants cannot do very well for months and months and months and months. They require constant attention. So Harvey Karp has wonderful recommendations for how to get cranky babies to sleep. A lot of them are counterintuitive. Uh, we tend to take children in our culture and put them in darkened rooms and cribs when it's time for them to be take a nap. He says that's a no-no. He says the way to help children early in life is to recreate the conditions of the womb as much as possible because they've been thrust out of the womb into all the confusion of being alive in the real world. So the womb is not an entirely dark place, but it is a darkened place. There isn't much light that makes its way through the flesh of the woman and into the womb, but it's a place of noises. They shouldn't live in silence if you want them to relax. Being in silence is very unfamiliar to them. They, they do, they're hearing the slushing of the woman's digestive tract all the time. They're hearing her heartbeat and they can hear ambient sounds from the uh, world around the mother while they're in the room. So to put them into silence is very stressful and they should be moving all the time. They're moving inside the mother. She gets up and walks around and then lies down and then stretches herself and then rolls over when she's sleeping. So motion of one kind and another is good. He's a big fan of those swinging uh, uh, chairs you can put children in that swing back and forth and tick and talk while they're swinging because they're making noise too. That's often a good place to put a cranky child to sleep, seated upward because they're in a kind of upward position in the womb and swinging them. 
and taking them for car rides is good. He, he recommends that they're particularly out of sorts, turn on the vacuum cleaner because the vacuum cleaner's white noise is very similar to what the noise is in the womb. And he's just full of a lot of tips like that. And he has videos of his using that, those, these techniques on kids before the age of three and how quickly they tune out and go into a deep sleep if one or another of these is used. So this is an important skill. So you don't feel frustrated with your own child and uncertain about what to do. Oh, he's a big fan of swaddling the children too. He suggests swaddling them until they're six months old. And that means wrapping them up in a blanket like the pupusas were in, in Native American tribes. And so their arms are pinned down by their sides because their arms were pinned down when they were in the womb too. And they're most comfortable if they're being wrapped and enfolded like that because that, that was the security environment for many months of their development before they got born. And I can keep rattling on suggestions he's making, but I, I would recommend any new, newborn parents get a copy of that book. It's a really a wonderful resource. Then I want to teach a little bit about developmental psychology. Uh, in the beginning, we need to be concerned mainly uh, from the first day of li real life outside of the womb with creating a good bonding experience for the child. The, the child and the person, it's typically the mother because she is going to most often now, she's going to breastfeed the child. So she is the one who when the child is cranky and out of source and needs to eat, opens her flesh and her nipple and her arms where she's holding the child and her looking into the face of her child, she offers, her, offers up herself in the bonding experience. And having peaceful and quick bonding experiences when the child is distressed is very important of creating in the child what Eric Erickson calls a sense of optimism and trust. And uh, I'm a big fan of breastfeeding. I, I, I know formula can be given. In my generation, unfortunately, only peasants uh, and stupid people were thought to uh, be interested in breastfeeding. Uh, educated people and cultured people gave bottles because they could have scientifically formulated formula to feed to the child and somehow that would result in a better life for the child they completely skipped over the bonding experience and it's important in producing good things for the babies uh also, the cutoff time in my generation was you should give nipples and bottles up until three months, and then you should start weaning the baby off a nipple. Even if you had to offer a pacifier or something like a nipple, you had to start introducing bits of uh, natural food, not formula, and on and on. So child rearing strategies for in my generation were very cruel and not responsive at all to, to what newborn infants needed. Uh, <clears throat> if the bonding experience is uh, kind and uh, well done, and if the soothing experiences that Harvey Karp teaches are implemented well too, the baby will spring forward in quite healthy uh, development. Uh, a shocking piece of research was done by a, a psychoanalyst, a British psychoanalyst with the name of Rene Spitz. He wanted to highlight what uh, the British School of Psychoanalysis was coming to believe was the overwhelming importance of early attachment and the early bonding experience and tied a lot of distress later on in childhood to children who had not been welcomed properly in that fashion. So he went and did a piece of research in Mexico City of all places. He had two sites where he was studying uh, children and the, the parenting person. One of them was an orphanage in Mexico City run by the Catholic Church. And it was in a very, very wealthy section of the city. Uh, the uh, orphanage was beautiful inside. It was aesthetically pleasant. 
the kids had beautiful cribs and, and very clean uh, blankets and lovely clothing and diapers to wear. And uh, <clears throat> they had the best of medical care and frequent medical visits. And the limitation was there was a certain number of nuns and often the children had to wait several minutes when they were in distress because the nuns were thin in number, uh, couldn't give direct care immediately when a child was starting to show signs like the child was now awake and asking for some kind of attention. But other than that, the place was sterile, very clean. The food that was fed later on was very nourishing food, the best. Medical care was always the best, and the nuns actually cared very much about the children. These children and their development were compared to the children of another group of women. Those women were in Mexican prisons. They had committed some kinds of crimes and had been sent to prison. But if you're a, a mother with a young child in a Mexican prison, you're allowed to bring your child with you. And provisions are made to have the children uh, be in their mother's cells in, in the space that the mother is occupying. So in those prisons, the, the mother, the presence of the child for the mother, unless she hated the child for some reason, was quite meaningful because it gave her something to do and something to think about other than their own plight as a prison inmate. And those children tended to be with their mothers 24 seven, all around the clock and at all hours. And of course, they were getting good attention. They were mainly on breast milk, unless the mother was having some kind of attention. They typically got fed whenever they started to cry and hunger in any way. There was not a lot of good medical care. The place was filthy. Uh, it was not very sanitary in there. And uh, you would have thought that the kids were, would be getting sick all the time just from the surrounding. Well, that was one of the measures used. How often did the children have respiratory diseases or infection? And the kids in the, uh, in, in the nursery where the rich people were, the, the orphans in the nursery had three times the rate of illnesses as the kids in the unsanitary conditions in the, uh, in the prison. For some reason, the combination of mother's care, the exposure to lots of germs and viruses built very robust immune systems in the little ones who were in the prison. Uh, also, next, uh, next important thing, developmental land, uh, landmarks. When did the kids pick up their heads by themselves? When did they sit up? When did they turn over? At every step of the way, the kids in the prison hit their developmental landmarks faster than the kids in the orphanage. And uh, the, the people who read this, these findings were absolutely shocked. It was the last thing in the world they would have predicted from just seeing the superficial nature of the surrounds the, that these kids were warehoused in. So I pass that on to anybody who's gonna listen to this or read the book because it's very, very important and what I consider powerful information about the need to have responsive, kind, and willing parents who will create that very special bond that exists between the caretaking person and the child because the psychological experience of being restored to comfort when one is uncomfortable and to being restored quickly by the same figure over and over again is very good for human development and builds into to people over the lifespan a much better attitude about being alive than if the early experiences are disruptive, chaotic, even if they're very antiseptic and have done in a very pleasant surrounding. The second, third piece of information I think is important about dealing with early childhood is uh, what the British School of Psychoanalysis again referred to as eight month anxiety. Now, I think something's wrong. There's some kind of strange retardation going on in England because the things they describe as eighth month anxiety, I believe are showing up 
every day in families I've seen and worked with and in my own life at about six months, not eight months. <laughs> I don't understand what's going on in England. Maybe it's the dreariness of the, of the overcast winters <laughs> that's retarding everybody. But what they're referring to is the following phenomenon. In the beginning, uh, uh, and, and Freud even commented on this, the, the newborn uh, uh, person has no sense of self and other. Life is a kind of blooming, buzzing confusion. That there is no such thing as a self. I am an I and you are a you. Something begins to change at around three months. If you show a picture of a human face, to a newborn, and it's no longer newborn, to a three-month-old, most three-months-old by, uh, by that age will look at a picture of a human face and smile. They're making some kind of pleasure response. It's not to a person, it can be to a picture. It's the configuration of the face itself, that there are two eyes and a nose, and maybe some hair and a mouth, that is a sign of comfort to them. They, they've latched on to looking up into the feeding person's face. It, it signals comfort to them and they smile with the beginning of a pleasure response to that configuration. Many parents take great joy out of this when the smiling starts, oh, he, he or she knows who I am. No, they don't know who, who the parent is at all. <laughs> they don't even know there is such a thing as an other and a self that that comes that's what eighth month anxiety is about which i think starts at six months so what i want to say is before six months and i'll stick to my six months it is quite easy for any couple if they want to to take some time away from the children if they want to go out for the evening, that's fine. If they want to take a weekend away, that's fine. The kid does not even know that they exist in any way. All that's needed is a very loving, very steadfast person who will fill in for the parents in the way that the child is used to be taken care of. Uh, if the, it's breast milk that's being had, the mother should pump a lot of breast milk so the feeder can give breast milk instead of a formula. And uh, the, the kid will find it awkward using the bottle at the beginning, but not terribly so. And uh, the, the parenting or parenting figures are quite replaceable. Now, I'm going to stress again and again today that one of the biggest tasks of the parents, even though they're being consumed by everything else, is to try and rebuild the structure of their own relationship. So here is a way to do it. Start dating each other again. Start taking little vacations from home again. You can do it safely. It will have no adverse effect on the child if you do it thoughtfully. And you will have time alone without all the distractions of parenting to begin to get to know each other. And there's all kinds of discussions that have to be made. How you've done things has been bankrupted. The same person cannot be responsible for the same things anymore. There has to be a new division of labors. There has to be new times that one's on duty and relieves the other. Start doing the work of restructuring what the uh, understandings are about how three persons are to survive in that space, no longer just two persons. It's very labor intensive to talk to each other and negotiate things. You need time away from the distractions of the baby, the time you put into your work or whatever else you're getting lost in. And so take time away just to be with each other so you have time to do the work that's required of you. Now, when six month anxiety is signaled uh, in, it's not from a, by a smile response on the part of one or another, uh, uh, on the part of the children in response to the facial configuration of one or another of the parents. It is terror. Now, uh, when the child is being held and the person being held may put the child down and start walking out the room, the child will scream in terror. They're not ready for the separation yet. And they're beginning to experience what Freud says is their primordial helplessness. They're beginning to understand that they're, they are a them and that there's somebody else 
that is like a big version of them that's responsible for keeping them safe and watching over them. And if that person disappears, they have no sense of time. They get frightened that they're going to disappear forever. And so be very careful about separating for very long. Uh, here's one thing that should be done. The child is well past uh, probably the beginning of being able to be put down on the floor, maybe even is starting to crawl a little bit. You can separate from the child if you stay within the visual field. And if you get too far away and the child looks over and sees where you are and starts screaming in terror, go over and pick the child up and comfort the child. Don't, don't let the child, quote, cry it out. That's particularly true over the next months ahead until the child is about three. So from about six months to age three, do not let separations go on for too long if the child is being stressed by the separation. Come back in and comfort the child again. There are games that can be played to help the child get used to that. Peeking at the child from around the corner so your face comes out and then standing up where the child can see all of you can often elicit a scream of, of delight from the child. Playing peekaboo can issue a stream of delight because the child is seeing the person can go away and reappear again and go away and reappear again. It doesn't mean necessarily if they go away that they're disappearing forever into the abyss. So games of loss and restitution are really very important to play with a child. Uh, you, you can uh, hide something in the room and then take the child to go find what you've hidden. Anything, anything about loss and restitution and the mastery of loss and restitution, those kinds of games should be played until the child is about three years old. Um, Okay. Parents make two kind of mistakes in response to the to six month anxiety. Uh, they can, they try and capture the kid. They're so frightened of the crying that starts when they separate. They try not to let any separation. Uh, if they're seated in a room and the child struggles to get down off the couch, uh, they they will pick the child up and put it back on the couch. They'll keep the child near them and not let the child begin to experiment with being separate until the child gets uncomfortable. The group that's particularly at risk from suff for suffocating a kid and not letting them begin the process of individuation are a group of young adolescent women who have wanted to get out of their houses and have allowed themselves to get pregnant, hoping that maybe they could get liberated from a, a toxic household or at very best, if they don't have that, they believe they now have created someone who will love them for the rest of their life. So like with a doll that they have, they wanna stay attached to that person. They don't see that person as a separate person with his or her own needs that needs to get separate from them and individuate from them and create greater and greater distance to them gradually over the years. That, that child was had so it can be a companion forever to the mother. And so that creates its own kind of habit. The second kind of havoc is the other side of the coin. It's women who, who value the increasing independence of their children. And they push the boundaries too far. Uh, career women who wanna go back to their career very early are an example of that. Just simple things like a woman is happy, the child's down on the floor playing with something. She goes into the other room. She gets into a telephone conversation with her best friend. The kid down on the floor is now bored, doesn't want to play with what he or she is playing with anymore. Starts screaming and crying and the, the woman's going like this. She's in the middle of the conversation and the child can just wait a few more minutes and it'll be okay. And she continues the conversation and leaves the child in great distress. That's not a good thing to do. Uh, what Harvey Karp talked about at the beginning of life needs to go on in a reduced fashion for a long period. That is, try to recreate what was in the womb. Try to make sure the child is comfortable again. 
do not let the child exist in great distress for long periods of time. Oh my. I said, suddenly the story of one of my clients occurred to me. Uh, interestingly enough, he had terrible hypochondriacal, hypochondriasis. He was constantly frightened that he was getting sick and he was gonna die and he would rush to the doctor. In some strange way, he had fallen into as a comfort device, what Freud referred to as body narcissism. That client found it very hard to build, he was heterosexual, found it very hard to build any continuing or enduring relationship with a woman. Uh, his most powerful relationship was loving and trying to take care of and respond to his body and make sure his body was not in trouble and his body was not betraying him. That's not something his mother did. His mother lived in an apartment, uh, relatives owned the building. Her uncle owned the restaurant downstairs and she was a waitress in the restaurant. So she would work the evening shift, sometimes from six o'clock in the evening till two o'clock in the morning when the restaurant closed. And every once in a while, she'd come to check on him, but she had no idea if he was screaming his lungs on upstairs or was in terrible terror or, or what he needed from her, if he was sleeping again peacefully. And sometimes he was only in an exhausted sleep for having been in terrible terror. He remembers one night when he was a year and a half and there was a horrible thunderstorm going on outside. The, wonder, the rain was pelting against the windows. The thunder was cracking very loudly, not far from where the building was. And he was screaming in terror over and over again. And nobody came to find him or, or to look at him. He, has, he had four such early life memories and it sent him toppling for the rest of his life down the wrong path. So getting preoccupied, lost in other things and leaving children too much alone, too much on their resources, too much on having learned to do self-comforting too early, uh, that's not good for children. And that is an error that can be made on the other side of the main line. As I said, round about age three, things seem to change again. The child is now very much a person. The child has will. The child has started saying no. The, the child has started to fight whether, whether if there's still diapers, whether a diaper is to be chosen. Child is refusing to get into the bathtub. Uh, God knows what kinds of things the child is doing. No, I'm not going to wear that to preschool. I don't want to wear that, but whatever. So the child is starting to individuate, to have a will and a plan that may be different than the parent's will and plan. And now a big shift has to be made in parenting, one of many along the path. This shift, again, in fairly early adulthood is to begin to experiment with letting the child lead and having the parent follow rather than the parent making all the decisions. I often ask the parents to use as a guide, if the child is wanting to do something quirky or different or not what you want the child to do, but it's not gonna hurt anybody, let the child do it. If, if a female child wants to wear the same skirt seven days in a row to school, She's not hurting anybody. Maybe it's some kind of strange comfort to have the familiarity of the same skirt on. Don't fight her about that. Don't, don't insist that she wear some other skirt. That's, that's a stupid battle to be having. And there are probably a thousand such examples of being gracious and just letting the child lead and uh, following. Uh, and a matter of fact, the rest of parenting from age three until the parents die and the children are in their 60s, maybe, should be governed by the same principle. Let the children lead and, let, and follow. Uh, let them script their own life. Let them discover what works and doesn't work. You don't have to be in charge and stay in charge of them for the rest of their existence. Let them make mistakes sometimes. That's okay, too. But I'm telling you, these topics are a whole other book. 
So I am going to stop here to allow some time for some feedback. I'm not going to talk about parenting anymore. Next week, I will start talking about the signs of a possible need for divorce. Can't be a good book about marriage without the signs of a possible need for a divorce. And I'll get into that horrible and complicated thicket next week. All right. Everything is open now. I don't know if this is a um, kind of like a, a correction, Arthur, but um, I, I, I recall and, and also kind of probably recall reading that, that kind of like an, an infant will recognize, and I'm not sure kind of like what exact month or, or, or time will, will kind of like recognize the face and the voice of the mother. But you had said previous, or you had said that, that it, you know. Um, I think that's a general recognition. I think the child is recognizing the configuration of a face as being connected with being soothed and the, and the sounds that a human voice makes with being soothed. And I think that the particular personhood of a particular person doesn't emerge until some months after the first beginning recognition of those stimuli patterns. Okay. And I think the people <laughs> who've written about that have been confused. They've been as confused as the parents have. The parents think they're being recognized, but I don't believe they are. So good, we can have a big argument about this. And I'm sure somewhere in, their, in the literature, there are some definitive studies of this topic. And if there are, I am not an expert on this topic. Okay. I would think, and, and I certainly kind of like recall my wife yeah. in, in terms of really feeling that, that not only was there recognition, um, I mean, actually there was feeding, you know, in terms of uh, breast milk, but there was recognition of the face and of the voice and that both were soothing to the infant. I, I know that uh, that belief is very sustaining for the parent. It helps the parent to feel immensely important and to have the motivation <laughs> to do what's necessary to do. I don't know if it's based on fact or not. I I'm going to Google this topic between now okay. and next week and see if I can see any definitive research. There, there must be also an attachment element involved with that as well. Yes. I've also heard that there are pheromones and that the child's uh, uh, smell system uh, is more sophisticated in some ways than uh, adults are, and that we turn off parts of our smell system as we get older and less dependent on smell as an orienting uh, scent, uh, sense that orients us. So uh, the baby is supposed to smell the unique smell of the mother. Yeah, I think there have been studies where moms can, you know, smell like a t-shirt or something from their baby over other babies. Yeah, it's possible. Like the, the, yep. I can also vouch for, uh, it's Harvey Karp, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, his book. Yeah, that, that came out right when my son was born and it was very useful. <laughs> very helpful, all those concepts, because it is a really tough time. Yeah, you're helpless. The kids have no words. They can't tell you what's wrong. You have to try and figure it out and it can be maddening. Yeah, and everybody's sleep deprived. And, yeah. Yeah, wondering why you did this. <laughs> but like Scott said, and like you were saying earlier, definitely worth it in the end. There are times where it's quite difficult, but uh, really, really fantastic in the long run, at least in my experience. I'm sorry, I went to a very dark place in response to your words. Mm. Uh, I was three years old and listening to my mother say to me, my trouble is all your fault and you should never have been born. Mm -hmm. uh,
Just think if it was just the opposite of what you were saying. I mean, that she adored you and that, uh, you know, in some ways that you're the, 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 the light, light of, of her, her life. life. Yes. Yeah. That, that's how I talk to my kids. I did not inflict mm -hmm. on them what had been done to me. <laughs> I still do that with my wife every morning. Tell her how glad I am that she came into my life and that I still have at least one more day with her. Oh, thank you. That's another thing I should add to my parenting list. Uh, every parent should read The One Minute Manager. It's a book supposedly about, by, written by a management consultant about how to have good morale in the workplace. He, he could have written that book in one paragraph. He didn't have to write a whole book. <laughs> it's really a very simple concept. If you have people who report to you, if you're a supervisor of other workers, make sure you stop by their workstation every day to say hello to them and find something to compliment them about or thank them for something they did yesterday that was particularly useful or tell them how glad you are their employee, that they have a sunny disposition. Say something appreciative about them every day. And it's particularly important if you have to correct them about something or give them some feedback that might feel painful to them, be sure you start with the compliment first before you have to deliver the thing. You're such a loyal and dependable worker. I don't know what I'd do without you here, but you made a mess yesterday. <laughs> then, you can, <laughs> then you can go into whatever the mess is. And damn it, husbands and wives need to remember that and do it with each other. And parents need to do it with their kids. We are so good about getting irritated with other people and telling them what's disappointing to us we take good behavior for granted and we don't comment on it. We don't appreciate it. And yeah. boy, is that the lubricant that makes the, <laughs> the, the gears of everything go well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tell people try to catch their kid, catch their partner being good. Yeah. Yeah, and notice it, you know, rather than always catching what isn't going well. They don't even have to be particularly good if they're just doing ordinary things mm -hmm. you expect them to do that's the oh, yeah yeah thanks so much oh. for sitting and quietly watching tv while i worked on this project you yes know, to, absolutely yeah. <laughs> that's what i that's the example i use <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> all right anything else before we say goodbye today hearing nothing i will let aaron oh i'm in charge of the meeting again i forgot I will check us out. And I'll be back next week to start talking about divorce. All right. Bye. Okay. We'll see Have you guys. Have a good weekend. Bye, guys. Bye.